Good afternoon. I am really honored to be here speaking with you. I have several friends, Bethany among them, who are graduates of Columbia, either the undergrad or the law school, uh, including one of my sister survivors. Uh, and I have always heard just incredible things. Uh, and I have, so I'm delighted to be able to be here and see just a glimpse of what I have been told about for so very long. I am really excited for our discussion today. Uh, it is a very sobering topic, but it is something uh, that is, uh, on a philosophical level, very fascinating, the concepts of justice and forgiveness and how they intertwine. Uh, but they're also very deeply personal concepts. They are deeply personal for me because of suffering sexual abuse, uh, both as a, a very young child uh, and also being a victim of Larry Nasser. Uh, but they're also topics that are very relevant for all of us uh, because all of us, to some degree or another, have been victims uh, of people who have wounded us. We have all uh, suffered injustice. We have all been hurt. And so we all wrestle with these questions of what do we do with that? What do we do with the pain? What do we do with the trauma? Is there life after suffering trauma and abuse? Is there hope to be found? And conversely, all of us, to some degree or another, have injured people, you know, myself included. And so these concepts of justice and forgiveness uh, are vital to us because we not only need to understand them for our own healing, uh, but we also need to understand them because we are beings who are in need of forgiveness uh, and who need that forgiveness in order to be free. Now, most of you are likely aware of my story, and Chelsea did a great job recapping it. Uh, but for those who aren't very familiar with it, I became the victim of sexual abuse at a very young age when I was seven. Uh, and at that time, it was a pedophile who was in my church. I was very fortunate because there were uh, some adults who recognized the warning signs and warned my parents, and my parents were able to take precautionary measures. And so it short-circuited the abuse before it became too severe. But it doesn't take a whole lot to do a lot of damage. Uh, and the response of my church community when my parents took those protective measures was by and large uh, very revictimizing and damaging. The church ended up ultimately splitting. I lost all of the adults uh, who I had grown up with who formed my concept of faith and church community. Uh, and so at eight years old, I was left wrestling with sexual abuse that I didn't understand, that I didn't even know how to verbalize, uh, and having lost my entire faith community. And it was an incredibly painful experience. And it really set the stage for what happened with Larry because the message that I internalized as an abuse survivor when I started to understand what had happened and asked my, started to ask my parents more questions, why did we have to leave the church? What happened to this Bible study? Uh, the message I walked away with was, if you can't prove it, don't speak up because you will lose everything. And so when I became a victim of Larry, uh, that was the message that I held and that I carried with me. And so getting to the place where I was able to report him took years of struggle. Most of you probably know how the story ended after 16 years of waiting and watching to see if there was any chance of being believed. Uh, I was able to make a report to the Indianapolis Star who published just an explosive investigation about the corruption at USAG. Uh, and within uh, a month of that, that initial USAG report coming out, I had recorded interviews with the Indy Star. I had compiled a complete evidence file to bring to prosecutors. I had filed a police report, started the Title IX process, uh, and everything was in motion. And the result was much better, honestly, than I had ever hoped for. To this day, more than, or almost 500 women have now come forward as survivors of Larry. And 256 gave victim impact statements between Eaton and Ingham County uh, and really forced the entire world to come face to face with the realities of sexual assault in a way that we had never had to wrestle with it before. Uh, but in order to be in a position uh, to really withstand the trauma, honestly, of coming forward so publicly, I had to get to the place where I could hold to what was true, regardless of what society around me said. When we told our pastors in Michigan what we were going to do, one of them asked a very insightful question. He said, uh, he said, is there anything that you're hoping to gain that you personally need to get out of this besides stopping Larry? Uh, and that was really a vital question for me because the truth is if my identity and my healing uh, was dependent on what 12 members of a jury said and I wasn't successful, the result would be absolutely crushing. And I had to get to that place of being able to hold to what was true regardless of what everyone around me might say. Uh, and the backlash was very vitriolic when I came forward. Uh, but wrestling with those concepts, those are concepts that I want to wrestle through with you tonight. Uh, and I'm not going to pretend that they're easy. Uh, re recovering from trauma is painful. 
Now, when I say that I wrestled with them, I mean that there were uh, nights of just weeping as I worked through the thought process you know, of, of being angry at God, angry at the people around me, angry at the adults that had let me down. You know, these are not easy concepts, but they're things that we have to think about and we have to work through uh, because it will destroy us if we don't. So what I want to do tonight is two things, or today is two things. First, just define our terms, justice and forgiveness. What do we mean by those terms? And then discuss how they intersect and what that means for us. So as we do that, it will become obvious to you, if it isn't already, that I am operating from a Christian worldview. That is, I believe that there is a God who is sovereign. I believe that he is revealed in the Christian Bible. Uh, And I believe that this is logically and intrinsically and extrinsically consistent with what we see in the world around us. But the reality is I'm not the only one here operating from a worldview. All of us have a religious view that we operate from, whether that is atheistic, agnostic, polytheistic, or theistic. All of us are coming from a faith perspective. And we are interpreting evidence uh, and thinking and reasoning from that faith perspective. And we can't discuss concepts that involve philosophy and morality uh, if we don't involve our worldview. So I think it's better just to be upfront about it. This is my worldview. Uh, So what do we mean by the idea of justice? We hear this term used all the time. And I think one of the best ways to really get a handle on what we mean by it is look at how it's used culturally. And one of the greatest cultural icons we have uh, of social justice is really found in Martin Luther King Jr., who advocated powerfully and literally changed the world with his concept of justice. And he wrote uh, beautiful writings on what this meant. And so I want to look at some of how he used the term justice to get an idea of what do we mean culturally when we discuss this idea. King wrote, I am not interested in power for power's sake, but I am interested in power that is moral, that is right, and that is good. And so the first thing we see with this pursuit of justice is that it is focused on some sort of moral standard. There's a standard that is anchoring King's pursuit of justice, just differentiating between what is right and wrong, what is good and bad. And then King further expounded on this writing by asking, cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it politic? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? And there comes a time when we must take a position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but we must take it because it is right. And this right, this pursuit of what is right, was not a standard that was utilitarian, based on political expediency and what could be accomplished. It was not a standard that was dependent on cultural ideas. It might not be the popular position. Rather, this standard of right came from something that was outside all of those dynamics, outside human perception, outside human reasoning, outside an outside moral source. In the same way that King powerfully taught that we are to ask that question, what is right? We see that justice is comparing something some event, some action, to this moral standard, and asking the question, was this right? This means two things. The first is that the standard exists. And the second is that if we lose that standard, justice becomes impossible. If there is not some standard by which we measure these actions and ideas, then there is no way to ultimately declare something just or unjust. I like the way C.S. Lewis put it, in his book, Mere Christianity. And this was a quote that I clung to during these last two years in particular. Lewis wrote, My argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But how had I got this idea of unjust and just? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has an idea of a straight line. What was I comparing the universe to when I called it unjust? And King also, much like Lewis, explicitly appeals to the standard of God as as the defining characteristic for what we ought to support or oppose. King wrote, if any earthly institution or custom conflicts with God's will, it is your duty to oppose it. You must never allow the transitory, evanescent demands of man-made institutions to take precedence over the eternal demands 
of Almighty God. Now, for those who wish to dive deeper into the argument that the Judeo-Christian God of the Bible is the God that sets these standards, I do highly recommend C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity, because the majority of the text uh, is, defined, is, is dedicated to deductively uh, looking at that argument. But for now, I want to expand on the conclusions that would flow from this worldview that are particularly relevant to our discussion today. And the first is this. Because the straight line exists, this means there is goodness and there is rightness. The standard of what is good and right does not come from our human opinion. Now, there are certainly many things uh, that are matters of opinion. But if our collective uh, opinion is what determines right and wrong, we ultimately have no basis for morality. For example, the idea that wrong is whatever harms the collective good. Well, who defines harm? Who is defining collective good? Who set the standard that harm is what defines the collective good? At some level or another, when you get down to it, without a standard that supersedes uh, human intellect, that supersedes our human opinion, we are always relying on ourselves. But if there is a moral lawgiver who has set this standard by which we can measure what is just and unjust, then goodness does exist. And for for someone who has suffered trauma uh, of any form, there are several very healing truths that flow from this reality. And the first is this. If goodness exists, there is hope. It is not just darkness. It is not just evil. This also means, for those who have suffered abuse and injustice, that you can call what happened to you evil and unjust, and you do not have to minimize it. You do not have to mitigate it. You do not have to downplay it. You can speak the truth about what happened to you because it is true regardless of what everyone around you says. This also means that you can grieve the damage. It is grief worthy. You do not have to prove it. You don't have to have 12 jurors affirm what happened to you to have permission to grieve the evil. You can speak the truth about it because there is a standard that exists outside of what culture says. And being able to speak the truth and to grieve non-destructively is the first step in healing from any form of trauma. And then the second implication we see from this worldview is that if there is a moral lawgiver who defines goodness, this lawgiver cares about justice. He cares about good and evil. In the Christian faith, Right and wrong flow not from some capricious decision, but from the very nature of God, from the very nature of the Creator. And the Bible teaches that the reason we feel justice so keenly is because it is such an aberration from what we were created to experience, such an aberration from God. And because goodness and evil exist in opposition to each other, in contrast, the more one understands the good, the more fully they will be able to understand the evil which means that God, being the ultimate source of goodness in the Christian faith, uh, is more able to even recognize the evil than we are and feels it more deeply and more keenly even than I can. Now, So if we are looking at the concept of justice and holding it up to what is right, ultimately this means that we each get what we deserve. But if justice means my abuser getting what he deserves, that's where we start to feel the tension between justice and forgiveness. Is it right for me to hope that someone gets what they deserve? Is that what, and how does that mesh with the idea of forgiveness? How can both be good? One of the first ways to look at that, of course, is we need to simply define forgiveness. Martin Luther King Jr. again wrote beautifully about the relationship between justice and forgiveness and powerfully advocated for a nonviolent pursuit of justice, a pursuit of justice that loved the oppressor that looked for reconciliation with the oppressor. And there are a couple key things about the way he used forgiveness that we need to understand and that help us discover how those intersect. And the first is this. In that use of forgiveness, the things that are being released are personal to me, are personal to the one that has been wronged. If I forgive, what I am releasing is my personal retaliation, my personal resentment, my personal right to vengeance. But justice... Justice is conformity to a standard that is outside of me. That means that I can release my personal retaliation, and that outside standard 
is still existing. That outside standard still calls evil, evil, without minimizing, without mitigating, without downplaying. And then the second dynamic is that I, like King, trust in that moral lawgiver to bring absolute and final justice. There is someone who is higher than me, who has set that standard, who is capable of meeting out justice far greater than I could ever meet out. The Christian faith teaches that not only does God love, but that God is just and that both are found. He pours out his wrath on evil, not because he is vindictive, but because he cares and trauma and injustice matter to him because that evil is even more glaring and blatant to God than it is to me. I absolutely love the way Martin Luther King explained this when he wrote, the God whom we worship is not a weak and incompetent God. He is able to beat back gigantic waves of opposition and to bring low prodigious mountains of evil. The ringing testimony of the Christian faith is that God is able. Very often the idea to us of God punishing and pouring out his wrath is seen as something negative. But what we need to understand when we're looking at how these concepts intersect is that justice doesn't happen because God doesn't love, but because he does. When my innocence was stolen as a young child, God saw that damage and he said, that was evil and it matters to me. And if we really think about it, do we want it any other way? I want you to think back to one of the other iconic sexual assault cases over the last few years, the Brock Turner case. Brock Turner's victim stood up, and in an incredibly heart-wrenching written testimony, she expressed the damage that was done to her and what was taken from her. And what was the judge's response? Six months. Six months, and Brock only served three. Did we as a society stand up and say, what a loving judge. We need more judges just like this one. No, we didn't. We intrinsically knew that the most unloving thing that judge could do was to minimize the evil that happened to that victim. And we also even understood that it was unloving not just to the victim, but it was also unloving to Brock because it left him in bondage to the evil that he saw as not that big of a deal. It reinforced the evil he was in bondage to. We intrinsically know that a good and right and loving judge looks at evil and says that's wrong and it matters. And that is the type of judge we have in the God of the Bible. This means that forgiveness, the giving up of personal resentment, does not change the external and permanent standard that God has set. And because God is a good and loving God, he has promised to bring justice. What this means is that I can trust him to bring justice, that it is not dependent on me, that I can release my personal retaliation and know that justice that is far greater than I could ever bring will be brought. But then the Christian faith goes a step further because the Christian faith adds to justice through an additional measure of incredible love where God offers to take that justice upon himself. The Christian faith teaches that God's love requires justice to be done because evil is real and the damage matters. But it also teaches that God, in his love and mercy, gave himself to allow the justice that should fall on evildoers to fall on himself so that those who repent and who turn away from their evil are able to receive ultimate forgiveness. And they don't receive what they deserve, not because it wasn't evil, not because it doesn't matter, not because saying the magic words, I'm sorry, makes it all better, but because God himself took that punishment that they deserved. Only in the Christian faith do we have a God who unfailingly loves enough to always bring justice, but also loves enough to take it upon himself to make forgiveness possible. Only in Christianity is evil never minimized, never mitigated, never downplayed, never outweighed by the other good things that the abuser has done. Only in Christianity can I release my personal retaliation and desire for vengeance because I know that justice is done and that standard exists outside of my personal response 
outside of what society says, outside of what culture might say. And because I have been the recipient of that incredible love that stood in my place, a love that is limitless, I can also hope for my abuser to experience this same grace. And I can know that if my abuser does repent, it does not mean that what he did doesn't matter. It does not mean that it wasn't evil or that it wasn't seen. Because justice is still done. The pursuit of justice, pursuing the conformity to the standard of rightness, this straight line is good and right. It is found in the character of God, and it is something we should pursue. And at the same time, forgiveness is something I am free to pursue. And this is why I frequently echo C.S. Lewis's other quote uh, in Mere Christianity. And with this, we'll close and open it for questions. Christianity, if false, is of no importance. If true, it is of infinite importance. The one thing it cannot be is moderately important. I believe in Christianity as I believe the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I can see everything else. Thank you.